On roads made for animals, the enemy is easily recognized. It's not the man who rides alongside you. It's the devil who lurks on the floor. Almost never has more than 40% of those who have started reached Roubaix, beaten not by the speed, but by the cobblestones of northern France known as pavé. Man and machinery break under the strain as riders are snatched from their bicycles by forces far greater than theirs. Since 1896, they've all aimed to win La Pascale. In 1990, who will it be? France have won the race only twice since 1956 and they pin their hopes this time in on-form world number one rider, Laurent Fignon. Belgium, who have won 46 of the 87 editions, have a number of capable riders again. One is Eddie Plankert, whose famous cycling family have yet to add Paris-Roubaix to their honours. Last year, Belgium surprised even themselves when Jean-Marie Wampers sprinted ahead of Dirk de Wolf. He would not be a surprise this time if he were to repeat. The road suit Belgian riders and Edric van Hooyerdonk, third last year, could succeed in a race he has always excelled in. Well, there are only a few of the 192 riders who should make the selection as the 265 kilometers unfold between Compiègne and Roubaix. But before we join the last 60 kilometers live with our colleagues from French television, let me bring you up to date now with the race so far. This is the entrance to the forest of Arenberg, an area of outstanding natural beauty and normally banned to all traffic. The only exception is Paris-Roubaix. The riders reached here after 160 kilometers with Peter Peters from Holland and just ahead of him on the right, Stefan Joho from Switzerland. They're in the lead by about three minutes. This is zone number 15 of 22 special Parve sections and it's the first really bad one, measuring 2.4 kilometers. This breakaway is facing cold weather and very strong headwinds coming down from the northeast. It seemed suicidal to have gone so early, but you know in Paris-Roubaix, someone always does. Three riders went ahead after only 18 kilometers this morning. The other rider was Peter's teammate from the Dutch TVM squad, Rob Kleinsman. But a puncture put paid to him on the pave after 127 kilometers. The biggest gap the three built up over the field was 16 minutes and 21 seconds and that came at the 100 kilometers covered point. But as I say, now it's been reduced dramatically and there is a chase group of some 22 riders just entering Arenberg. You can see that the crowds here in the forest, it's a favorite vantage point because when the racers pass by, the nearby auto route means they can still catch up with the race further along towards Roubaix. This is Stefan Yoho, he's no stranger to the long break. Two years ago when Dirk de Mol won, he was in the leading breakaway before he was left behind by de Mol and Wegmuller. And now these are just the two survivors. They've been out in front for over 140 kilometers. But the chase behind is fierce and in the group, I can tell you, is Laurent Fignon, four Panasonic riders, Olaf Ludwig, Jean-Marie Wampers, last year's winner, of course, Eddie Plankett and Urs Frehler. This is Nico Verhoeven and behind him is Frédéric Moncassin. Interestingly enough, first year professional, last year he won the amateur version of Paris-Roubaix. Verhoeven, Eddie Plankett has come up near the front as well. They're heading up towards the exit of the forest. The two leaders are already through the forest and they've got themselves back together. And there's Moncassin searching the grass and perhaps a slightly smoother ride through the woods. Each member of the chasing group here, numbering 22, seeking their own stretch of road and just answering the pace being set by Nico Verhoeven. Who, by the way, started this morning without his team leader, Sean Kelly, because of a broken collarbone in last week's Tour of Flanders. So Verhoeven was the leader as they left the forest, followed by Eddie Plankett, Laurent Fignon, Jean-Marie Wampers and Frédéric Moncasson. 
very elite group indeed and none of the favourites at this point missing the split. Ahead of that group by some three minutes, Yoho rejoined again by Peter Peters, the former champion of Holland, still faced 100 kilometres including 36 kilometres of Parve before Roubaix. Plankett, the sprinter, was forcing the pace behind and joined here by Laurent Fignon and last year's winner and Plankett's teammate, Jean-Marie Wampers. So the Panasonic team are playing a very attentive role in the race so far today with four riders in this chasing group and Plankett himself willing to do a lot of work indeed into the headwind. Well, that was the situation during the first half of the race, but the two leaders finally did succumb. Last of all was Yoho, and approaching Orkies, Plankert had gone ahead alone to be joined by the Frenchman Marshal Guéant and Belgian Kurt von Kiersbulk. We can now join my live commentary with 60 kilometers to go to the finish, and what a finish it proves to be. Well, this is Eddie Plankett and everybody here alongside me is wondering exactly what is in the mind of Eddie Plankett today because he's left himself a lot of work and he's the sort of man who probably could have won this race in the sprint if he'd have come to the finish in a reasonably sized group. This is Marshall Gale, a much more likely candidate for the long escape. And this rider, well, you'll have to forgive me, but there is very little known about Kurt van Peel's book. He is a third-year professional rider with only one win under his belt and that was in a local race in Belgium. But he's certainly in his first Paris-Roubaix settled in very quickly to mixing with the stars. He made that big split that came into the forest of Arlenberg, some 22 riders. The field, as you can see now, has regrouped somewhat into a bunch of around 50 or 60, so there has been a slowing of the pace behind. Perhaps somewhat relieved that they did sweep up that early breakaway of three riders. Rob Kleinsman being desperately unlucky when he punctured after 127 kilometers on the Parve. And then Stefan Yoho finally blowing up. When Plankett got up to him, in fact, Yoho took one look to his right and said he went past him like a moto. And that, by the way, is French for motorbike. And there is Plankett now, who was out on his own, but has now been joined by the attack from Marshal Guéant of France and the Belgian rider who's joined him at the back here, Kurt van Kiersbulk. The lead is a tenuous one. It is still only just over a minute and there's a lot of work being done. We'll go back to the breakaway very short, to the main field rather very shortly and show you what's going on back there. But for the moment, Plankett isn't quite working as hard as one might expect. He may be wondering whether this is a foolish move or not because this headwind is not going to change between now and the finish which is still some 60 kilometers away. So Blanket is not doing his full relay. Marshall Geyer, professional since 1983. And France really are hoping now to start the season off with a good win. It's a country which is not winning races like it used to, that's for sure. Uh, since the retirement of Bernard Eno, Laurent Fignon, who won Milan San Remo last year and the year before, is still back in that chasing group, but at least he is in the chasing group. We're going on to Parve number eight here. Remember there are 22 sections of Parve, they in fact count down from section 22 to section number one which comes about four kilometers from the finish. And this by the way is after 215 kilometers. The only saving grace is that the weather is very very dry indeed, sunny and cold. So the crowds that normally flock out here to watch the riders virtually swim through mud are being treated to being covered in dust and most unpleasant indeed. There are many sports you have to watch in these conditions and there are certainly none in which you have to participate in such conditions. Flat fields in the north of France and one way to follow Paris Bay by the way you can look across these very flat fields here and you can always see where the race is by the dust cloud and it looks as though 
The young Belgian, he's 24 years of age, is having trouble hanging on. They tend to ride these heavy gears and go over the cobblestones as quickly as they possibly can, almost skimming over the surface, but there's such a risk of breaking a wheel. Well, this is Van Kiersbulk riding for the Belgian Isoglass team. Third year professional, but as I say, he's only won one race, and that was in October last year. In fact, he won at Zvevezela in Belgium. Finished 10th in the Belgian Championship last year. That's a hotly contested championship, so he really is a rider of developing talent, I would think. And he had a very good fifth place in the Grand Prix Pino Cerami. Pino Cerami, another famous Belgian of days gone by. And now we can see the field really has uh, swelled up a bit, hasn't it? 22 riders was in this group, and now we've got some in the region of 60, I would say. Each one trying to find his own way over this parve of Section 8. They are only just down the road, you know. There's a gap of around 45 seconds. It's by no means a convincing escape by Plankett, who was at one stage a minute 20 seconds up. Gayon got across with uh, the Belgian rider. Now they've got three, re three leaders up there. There's Laurent Fignon, second in our picture at the moment. Dirk de Wolf from the PDM team, second last year behind Jean-Marie Wampers. Both first and second place rider are in this breakaway. And in fact, it's true to say the first three riders are certainly here because Edwig van Hooydonk, the Belgian rider, is also in this group. Follow my leader, as everybody tries now, and the Panasonics are very prominent right up at the front of this group. Urs Fröhler, the Swiss former world champion on the track, is trying desperately to slow down pursuit here of teammate Eddie Plankett. And look at the face of Eddie. A few deep breaths. Well, Plankett has been a man for Paris Bay over the years. He rode his first. La Pascal in 1981 when he finished 13th, unlucky for some. And then he popped up with a fifth place in 1982. Fifth still remains his best finish. He's done it twice, 1982 and 1989. Now the echelon forming there, indicating the wind coming from the top right-hand corner of our picture. And the riders coming through on the lee side to take up the pace. And you see Eddie Plankett is not working as hard as perhaps Gaon and certainly the enthusiasm there of Van Kiersburg. He looks quite a strong rider, doesn't he? Well, he's been advised by the man they used to call the Gypsy, the Giton, Roger de Vlaminck, who without doubt has been the star of Paris-Roubaix over the years, the record man, four victories for Roger de Vlaminck, 1972, 74, 75, and indeed in 1977, but he's also been second four times and third once. A magnificent record. And you know, he never had a mechanical problem or a puncture until he rode Perry Bay for the very last time. And he has been talking to Kurt von Kiersburg and explaining to him how to ride this race. And he advised him to go off in an early move. And my goodness me, he's done it. This is Steve Bauer. And he's calling for a little bit more assistance from the rest of the race. Bauer seems to me to be the only member of the American 7-Eleven team in this group. We've got two Weimann riders here, Thomas Wegmuller and Adri van der Poel. And look at this turn of speed by Laurent Fignon. Fignon has been exceptionally active already to keep this race in close contact with the three leaders. You never know when Fignon is going to put on a, a show like this. And just look at the speed of him now. The former Tour de France winner, 1983-1984. He comes and he goes, he antagonises, he annoys. But when he can produce a ride like this, and now he's wanting more action from the rest of the riders, look. 71, there is Van der Poel. And the tall rider going through there, and here he is again, is John Tarlin. Well, John Tarlin's had a good start to the season. He's high up in the World Cup standings at the moment. A good finish in the Tour of Flanders. He was fourth last week and third last week in the Tour of Flanders. Which is won by Moreno Argentin from Rudy Darlins. Argentin, by the way, has chosen not to ride today. And I find that a surprising decision, the Ariostia rider from Italy, because 
he's clearly on tremendous form and this would have been a good race for him I'm sure but he hasn't ridden Peru Bay yet and he's chosen not to come today an awful lot of riders you know don't like Paris-Roubaix and Bernard Eno, the last rider from France to win it back in 1980. They say he, 1981, I think he won it. They, in fact, say he only won it so he could criticize the organization for, for being so inhumane. And in fact, he never rode it again. Well, it's a case of keep off the road. As the crowds climb up the bank there to watch the Field being dragged through. This is still the chase crew. Finon is back in this group somewhere. But the Panasonic team are riding a magnificent race. They're marking everything. So Eddie Plankett knows what the team will be doing. Before he broke away, he knew he was one of four riders in the chase group. And it wouldn't surprise me now if a number of the team have come up in this second party, which has formed this rather big bunch. on back to the front and he's turning those pedals again in determination look at him ripping that gap open tremendous turn of speed Laurent Fignon when he won his two tours de France he was undoubtedly the best time trialist in the world and now he's showing us a little bit of that turn of speed you can't get to the face of John Tarlon I think it is in his slipstream to see just what it's like because he's, hot, he's hanging on here to Fignon who's pulled them off that section of cobblestones. Uh, it's a very narrow road, this. We've just, in fact, crossed the main route between France, the main auto route between France and Belgium. They are in really narrow roads, and it's a big problem now with Paris Bay because each year a few more cobblestones are tarmacked over, and the organization's heart drops a little bit further down into the, its boots. One or two sections of road, they've asked the local governments to stop uh, surfacing them, because the character of the race would disappear completely if the hell of the north was to become completely tarmacked. But Albert Bouvet, a classic winner in his own right, who is the technical director of this race, goes out in the winter in search of the worst roads he can find. He even asks people to write him and tell him where they are. But I would think by now, Mr. Bouvet knows exactly where they all are. Back up with the leaders. Get some feeling here of the bumping and banging that's going through the body of the young 24-year-old Belgian, Kurt van Kiersbulk. Plankert working very hard too. The riders today usually packing their handlebar tape there or wearing something inside their gloves to try and cushion the effect because by the end of today, after seven hours over these cobblestones, the 57 kilometers of them, by the way, during the ride today, they usually find their hands are ripped to pieces. Long turns at the front by Marshal Gaillon. And this is Fignon doing yet another long turn at the front too. If you can see his wheels there, you see he rides these special wheels and specially thick tyres that, that develop for Paris-Roubaix in the hope that they will survive longer without going down. And Fignon has had no problems so far, but again he's going to get pretty annoyed about this. He's being marked very heavily by two Panasonic riders. That's John Tarl and just behind him desperately trying to interfere with the chase. That's Claudio Chiapucci just slipping through our picture. And number 12 here is Uwe Appler. One of the East German riders, one of the two East German riders this year who joined the PDM team with the liberation of East Germany. They were allowed to turn professional this year. Uwe Ampler, probably the finest amateur rider at the time of turning professional this year. Three times winner of the famous Peace Race and also a former world champion. He won his title in 1986 in Colorado Springs in the United States. Well, if it wasn't Laurent Fignon setting this pace, I would say that he was doing far too much work because he is he has so many riders in this group who could come and help him, but he seems content to set the pace. He might feel, and you often do when it's on your day, that you can destroy anybody by riding at the front. Fignon, just look at this working away so hard and he's not going to receive any help at all from the Panasonic they're the boys in red and yellow just behind him they're going to sit there happily in his slipstream but this gap is down to 30 seconds on the leaders 
and it's all down to Fignon's effort. Nobody else is helping him, but I bet if he gets up to those three leaders, there'll be a few more willing to come and attack him. John Tarlan, riding, you can pick him out pretty easily. Red hair, long, tall body. And that looks to me as though it might be Olaf Ludwig who's popped up there just behind him. The East German Olympic champion who's gone to the Panasonic team along with Uwe Ampler and Uwe Raab. Of course, they've left the East German national amateur squad and come across the professional ranks this year. Ludwig ending his season last year in the Commonwealth Bank Classic in Australia and he only lasted a day unfortunately a tremendous crash coming downhill into a town called Lismore and he fell on his hand and he broke his wrist but he's back to form now he's looking forward to his first Tour de France coming up and he's riding Paris-Roubaix for the first time and learning what it's all about to be in the hell of the north back to the leaders Ponytail of Eddie Plankett. Current trend amongst all of the favourites in world cycling. Robert Miller started with the first to ponytail and it spread through the pack like wildfire. Now we have Solon Lilholt from Denmark, Eddie Plankett, Laurent Fignon himself, Phil Anderson, they're all at it. And there's an example, there's Laurent Fignon's ponytail for good measure. Well, he's found one or two riders to come up and help him, but they want more action from the front. And you see all of the time, this is Urs Frölen, number two, who finished 10th in this race a year ago. He's another Panasonic rider. Steve Bauer might feel a little bit claustrophobic in this move at the moment. And service for Duclos Lazal. Well, that's sad. Gilbert Duclos Lazal, I think this is the second time today he's punctured and it's not coming quick enough for him. And he's getting a little bit upset. Duclos Lazalle clearly requires a wheel. It's not clear to me whether it's front or back, but I think a right hand up means the back wheel because very often the riders put left up for a front wheel. But he wants a wheel and that's for sure. And this race is in full cry because they're very, very close indeed to those three leaders. And it's again Laurent Fignon who's doing some tremendous turns of speed. Well, if nothing else, he's certainly exciting the viewers to French television as Fignon turns on the style. And Steve Bauer is the one who has brought him back, but he's made the effort to catch him, and he can't work. Look, he's had to slow right down. The echelon has formed again across the road. They're more content to capture Fignon than to work with him right now. And they can almost touch these three leaders, although we can't show you the gap at the moment. They are coming close. Then this continual slowing down, the gap is opening again. The consistency of the breakaway is paying off right now and the Panasonics are having their way. Those red and yellow jerseys are really employing terrific tactics here. They're destroying the morale and there's the Panasonic team car actually going by the team, driven by Walter Plankett. And very shortly we'll see him up with the leaders. This is Duclos Lazal coming back. Duclos Lazal who has a tremendous record in Paris-Roubaix, not least his two second places. And it looks to me as though Lazal himself is riding quite inspired today. One day he feels he is going to win Paris-Roubaix and it may well be today. He's a rider in fact that one wonder if his career had been put in danger when he was one of his favorite hobbies off the bicycle is hunting. And in fact, when he was apparently climbing a tree with a shotgun, it went off and it damaged one of his hands. But he came back. He's a very popular personage. Everybody enjoys his company. He's very popular with the French people. A colorful bike rider. And here at the front, we have two old hands and one absolutely new one. And they're working well together. Three different teams. But Toshiba and Iso Glass. Toshiba is the team of Gaon, Iso Glass the team of Van Kiersbulk. They haven't really got much strength behind to block for them, and nothing like the strength of the Panasonic team who are working themselves to death here to stop any counter-attack coming up the road. And it's because of this strong headwind 
But nobody really wants to get down to working. That was Van Hoyerdonk who went to the front there, briefly. There's Fignon, prowling the bunch, wanting some more help. Number 13 there on the right of our picture is Rudy Darnans. He's a man for Paris Roubaix. He hasn't won it yet, but he's been very close over the years. Wearing number 13, though, so he won't want to be reminded about what happened last year in the Tour de France when he wore 13 because he was looking certain to win down near Toulouse in Blagnac. He came round the left-hand corner, 500 metres to go, clear of the field and fell off. You can imagine what the conditions can be like in Paris-Roubaix when in some springs in Europe we have the snow coming down or ice cold rain sweeping across these open fields. We're heading up towards the Belgian borders and these are the roads that were ravaged by World War I and II and in fact it was after World War I when the road was so badly damaged that the title was given to them of the Hell of the North because they ran the race in spite of everything. That was in 1919 when World War I devastated these roads. Still the Panasonics. There's Carla Bowmans has moved up in this breakaway, I think. He's up in the third place. And also there, still Johnny Tarlin. And the man doing all of the work and nobody willing to help him, Laurent Fignon. Classic winner, and certainly on a high today. One water bottle there, room for two, but he's chosen to carry only one. Although the weather is sunny and the shadows are portraying that, it is bitterly cold and this wind is ripping through them head on. Twenty-two sections of Parve and the 192 riders are already down to inside 100 left on the course. Quite frankly, if you're not in this leading group now, I don't think you're going to see much of the finish. Nobody willing to help. Fignon, Johnny Tarlin. A tall rider, now starting to develop nicely as a professional rider, picked up by Peter Post for the Panasonic team having the best start to his season so far as a professional. As I say, he had a very good ride. He was third in the Tour of Flanders behind Moreno, Argentine and Rudy Donners. Donners has also made this split here. Those two riders have another interest, of course, and that's a good shot at winning World Cup points today because this is the third round in the Perrier World Cup series. And Donans is already a challenger. Moreno Argentin is the leader of the World Cup. Gianni Bunio was the leader because he won Milan San Remo a couple of weeks ago. And then uh, Argentin popped up with a good win in the Tour de Flanders to back up his fine finish in Milan San Remo. Well, I can't help feeling, in fact, that uh, Fignon is overworking himself here. Jean-Marie Wampers going through, and that's to see the corner rather than to help Lonon Fignon, I can assure you. Now, this particular corner here in days gone by in Paris Bay is usually a mud bath. It's usually very, very deep in water. The crowd would not stand that close because they'd be soaking wet, but today it is stone dry. And today the riders will be getting very, very annoyed by the dust in their eyes makes the eyes so sore and the great problem is and always a possibility is that in the ensuing few days after the race they start to develop conjunctivitis. Well there's no denying that this has been the day so far of Kurt von Kiersbulk. The early hero was Stefan Joho, stayed out front for over 160 kilometers but now this virtual unknown, well one nice claim to fame for him is that he is married to the daughter of Benoni Behet. And in case you've forgotten about that man, he won the World Championship in 1963 in Rene when, uh, when he was accused of being the wrong winner. And the Belgians wanted his teammate and team leader, Rick Van Lloyd, to win. And the famous picture is, it appears 
that Behet is pushing Van Looy backwards as they cross the line, but he's always denied it, and he was the world champion, and Rick Van Looy and Benoni Behet never spoke again. Well, Kurt Van Kiersburg is married to the daughter of Benoni Behet, so it's a great family because his father and his grandfather also raced, and despite being only 24 now, Van Kiersburg has been riding for 12 years. Now this here is Rick Van is uh, Rick Van Looy. This here is Edwin Van Hooydonk, who has now started as some sort of counter attack. Well, he came to fame in the Paris Bay. He's uh, an unknown professional. He took fifth place a couple of years ago. He was third last year. It is amazing how some riders can absolutely rise to the occasion of a particular race. And there are a number of riders that would apply to, particularly to Paris Bay. They seem to bring themselves into the right mental approach to this race. They come here to do well, and they do well. There's Carlos Bowmans in the black, gold, and red jersey as champion of Belgium. Number 124 here, that's Johan Museu, who is another improving professional cyclist this year, fifth in the Tour of Ireland Nissan Classic a year ago. This pack is continually splitting now. There's the second group, and it looks to me as though Fignon is leading the second group, so he's making a lot of elementary errors. He's working so hard at the front, he's allowing riders to go by him, and now he's having to close up a gap himself. He really is, to my mind, wasting a lot of energy the way he's riding this race today. He'll probably prove me wrong by the finish. He has to close down this small group which is developing at the front and again it's the panel's reaction from the chase group. And it's Steve Bauer, in fact, who has caused that split. Fignon has brought the rest of the race on. Donnans is just behind him. There's Nico Verhoeven to the left of our picture. Fignon and Donnans and Olaf Ludwig. John Tarlan moving up towards the leaders again. My goodness me, he's played a good teammate to Eddie Planker today. He's been straight to the front to slow down the race whenever possible. Ballerini's an interesting inclusion in the yellow jersey there. We haven't seen him before yet. So he's in this selection. Don's at the back now. So too, uh, Laurent Fignon, number 101. Uh, Johan Museo, 124. Ballerini just in front of them in that yellow Del Tongo jersey. Steve Bauer crouching down in the center there of our picture, and this is really now a select group. Any one of those riders would be a great winner of Paris-Roubaix. They're going to have to see they're going slow again. If they're going to continue like this on these stretches of road, they're going to lose ground. The gap, in fact, has opened up to a minute again. They were down to 30 seconds. They almost had them. And Plankard knows if he can keep this up, and the same must be said of the other two with Plankard, they will know too that this strong Panasonic team are going to ride in this second group and they're going to employ these spoiling tactics. But there are plenty of riders here to stop that. Let's go and have a look up the leaders again. You see all three still working well and the surprise certainly Kurt Van Kiersburg. He won the Tour of Flanders as a junior rider. Well, I suppose that would indicate something. But he's come into professionalism rather unannounced. He's riding for the small teams in Belgium. He started out with um, ADR, it would be, and then he moved over last year to Humo. This year he's joined the Isoglass team. And so he's not really won the eye of the top professional teams, like, for example, Panasonic or Toshiba, who are both here. But he might have done himself a lot of good today because he's riding very, very well indeed. And for a change, a nice piece of smooth road. And there aren't too many of these around this part of France. Marshal Gaillon, not only a Frenchman, but a local rider too. Coming from this area of France. Turned professional in 1983. Had his first crack straight away at Paris-Roubaix. When he finished 33rd. And that, by the way, was last. Now, there's more attacks. Fignon, I think, has been forced to bridge a gap here. While we're up to the leaders. There's been a small group split off the front, and Fignon again caught napping, and now having to put his head down to close the gap. But look at this effort. There's nobody grabbed his wheel. They're all trying. And again, Johnny Tarlan, who has marked him out of it, has come back right up to him, luck, and three wheels onto his back wheel. But Fignon has crossed the gap, and I'm not too sure who those riders are just now, but we'll find out in a minute. There's a general regrouping, but this big group is getting smaller and smaller. 
This is the lead group again. Van Kiersbull doing a lot of work. Eddie Plankett riding. A very, very steady race here. He was the rider, don't let's forget, he was the rider who went clear to bring back Stefan Yoho, the last one of the three escapers earlier this morning. And he was facing at the time that he attacked some 95 kilometers to the line. He picked them up, he stayed out alone, he was joined by the Belgian and the Frenchman. And since then, they have literally dangled in front of this group, who surge one minute and freewheel the next. It's all back under control of Panasonic. Well, Eddie Plankett has been a professional since 1980. He will know only too well what his team will be doing behind. And the comfort is when he looks around and sees the cars following the yellow car there, number two car, is the neutral service car here to help these riders if they have a problem. And that car is only allowed to stay behind them when the gap is 30 seconds or more. So Plankett knows that he has at least 30 seconds at the moment over the chasers. Very, very tenuous lead indeed. And he'll have to keep an eye on Marshal Guyon, who is the specialist of lone escapes. He popped up with a wonderful silver medal in the World Championships in 1988. He did profit by the little fight that took place between Claude Killion of Belgium and uh, Steve Bauer of Canada. Bauer was in fact disqualified and the rights and wrongs of that will be debated for many a day to come. And the title went, in fact, to the man who didn't get involved in the punch-up. That was Fondriest. Well, Fondriest, by the way, started this race as second favourite. Just behind Laurent Fignon this morning, he's already out. He's had a series of mechanical problems and he's climbed off. Now, this is Edric van Hooyerdonk going clear. And stamping on the pedals. They've left him unmarked. He's got the, the elastic is stretching. Now, can he break it? because I think there's no reaction. Now, any riders who could reach that front group, you know, are all going to benefit by the terrific team blocking of Panasonic. Van Hooyedonk riding for the new Dutch team, the Buckler team, the Panasonics will not want Van Hooyedonk to win. There's bitter rivalry amongst the professional teams in Holland. They do not share in the delight of others when any of the Dutch teams triumph, unless it's them, of course. Well, Van Hooyedonk, 23 years of age, Seems to have been around an awful lot longer than that, doesn't he? But he turned professional back in 1987. And there's another rider going off the front, and that looks to me as though it might be Dirk de Wolf. Dirk de Wolf tried to create a reaction. He was second in this race last year, beaten in the sprint by Jean-Marie Wampers. And it looks like de Wolf is not going to be allowed to escape the pack, but that might be enough reaction to try and bring back Van Hooydonk. Gilbert Duclos Lazal was the rider who came over the top of the Hooven there. And here are, these are the three leaders. It looks as though they're not going quite as well as that chase group now. The gap is coming down again. And the cars are going by. There's the neutral service car gone as well. So it's inside 30 seconds. It could be the beginning of the end here. Plankett will have made note of that as we look down at the distance. Well, just the other side of those cars. And I don't know if Van Hooydonk is still alone out there, but if he is, then he's coming up very, very quickly indeed, and they've moved the cars out of the way to make it fair. In other words, they create a vacuum, and Van Hooydonk must cross the gap only on his own effort. That's if he's still there, and it looks like he is. Here he is. So, Edwig Van Hooydonk then. Turn pro at the end of the 1986 season, then had his first full season in 1987. He's now coming up to the leaders, and this is Van Hooydonk's favorite race. There's no doubt about this. He was discovered with a fine fifth place in 1987. He was third last year. Now he is joining the leaders. Tremendous chase. We're still 35 kilometers from the finish and there's still an awful lot of racing to be done. The long, thin legs of Van Hooydonk. He rides a very small frame for a big man. He likes to feel that bicycle right underneath him. And you'll see when you get a side view of him just how high he keeps his seat pin. But he's on. Hardly a glance. Warranted there from Eddie Plankett. A little check back though to see if anybody else is coming across the gap. Now this is the time I suppose when one is not supposed to panic. You get on with the work and you hope that the field behind will lose their impetus. 
You now have three very experienced professionals. Van Hooydonk looking a little bit puffed after, after that chase across. And it looks to me too as though Van clears bulk there, his shoulders are beginning to roll. That's often the first sign that the old legs are beginning to ache too. Marshal Gaillon slipping back. These riders again willing to work together. Look, Van Hooydonk has recovered quickly from that chase, sign of a fit man. Covered extremely quickly. Now he's willing to work. This is a chase group here. Again, he's being messed up by the Panasonics. I think that is Rudy Darlins trying to cause some sort of a reaction. We have Thomas Wegmuller in that group and two Panasonic riders, John Marie Wampers, I think it was, and Johnny Tarlin. Let's have a look down here. They are. There's Tarlin and Olaf Ludwig, in fact. And Duke Lozal has crossed the gap. So again, there's been a little bit of shuffling of the pack. And this group, all of the time, is existing only of strong men. Thomas Wegmuller, whose nickname is Thomas the Tank, because of the way he can ride so fast on his own. Great time trialist. And his memories are not happy ones of Paris-Roubaix. He was second here to Dirk de Mol two races ago. And uh, everybody says he would have won, but he got a plastic bag wrapped up in his gears and everything seized up in sight of the finishing line when it was a two-man sprint. But that's unfair to say he would have won uh, because Dirk de Mol won and was a great winner, even if a surprised one. But it's been a bad day for Dirk de Mol today too because I can tell you that further back down the road he's had all sorts of problems. He's crashed twice. It's the ups and downs of Paris-Roubaix, the queen of the classics taking her revenge on him and he's out of the race. There's Fignon getting back into the swing of things and he's come back up to this lead group but they've lost a man from it now of course. There's four riders up front, another one going off the front here. Looks like a PDM rider on the attack. And in fact this is Joss van den Acker from PDM who's going. So this would be yet another different team represented. And I told you about the, the Dutch riders not liking the other Dutch teams. We've got a Buckler rider up front, we've got a Panasonic rider. So it seems that there just has to be a PDM rider on the way as well. And this looks like Van Kleersbulk has tried to go off the front of this group. Well, hats off to him. He might be feeling that the race is closing down and it's time to move away again. Like it refusing to be panicked. Let's have a look back. Goodness me, well that's how close they were. Inside 20 seconds, in fact, is the official gap from that chase group of Fignon to this league group. And it looks as though Van den Acker has scooted across the gap. We now have five riders, at least we will have, if they pick up Van Cleer's book. How many races have been won by a breakaway building up just like this? Very soon it'll go away if there's not a fast reaction from the field. Well, Joss van der Acker is not the star performer of the PDM team. He's left most of those in his slipstream at the moment. We'd have expected to see somebody perhaps more in the line of Rudy Darnans or Uwe Ampler up here. But as so often happens, they're heavily marked in that chase group. And instead we're seeing uh, John van der Acker joining the leaders. Five riders now in the front and they're all coming back together. They've, got to, they've really got to bring back Van Kier's book. He's sitting out there like a carrot. And he's certainly, I thought he was getting tired earlier. I was quite clearly wrong. He's going really well again now. Well, he's going to go back to Belgium, a star after this superb performance. His first crack at Paddy Roubaix. He showed no fear at all. Remember, he came up to the leader, Eddie Plankett, along with Marshal Gaon, whose attack it was. And has been very active ever since. An inspired man today. As Belgians so often are, you know, they've won 45 of the 87 Paris-Roubaix. And France are a rather poor second with only 26 victories. The Italians with only seven. And the Dutch riders have only four. And if we want to finish off the few minutes of statistics. Well, Ireland has won twice, both under the guise of Sean Kelly. Germany has won only one. And Luxembourg and Switzerland have also won one. That's the destiny of all of the 
Paris-Roubaix since way back in 1896 when Joseph Fisher won the first one at an average speed of 30 kilometers an hour it was 280 kilometers in those days this one let me remind you is 265 we're coming down to the last 30 of them and look at this now there's an absolute wholesale panic back here Fignon is grabbing wheels as well he's third in the picture at the minute but look, they, they're marking their men. They're, they're, I can't understand this. I've never seen a Paris Bay where the riders just come almost to a standstill. They've allowed now the odd man to get away. And it could turn out to be a very clever move because they've put a buckler team up here in the shape of Van Hooydonk at the back. The PDM have put their man up in the shape of Van Den Acker. Panasonic have their man. All these teams now represented are going to start turning off the power in the chase group and Laurent Fignon is finding himself in a rather difficult situation. Nobody really to help him because he's no teammates down in that group. Uh, Frédéric Moncassin, who rode so well through the forest of Arlenberg, is now out of it. And so Fignon is left to do whatever he can and he, he really will, should think more like Steve Bauer because Bauer is riding a good race in this group. He's the only 7-11 rider in the team in this breakaway and he is watching wheels. Really he should have been up here too though I fear. Well this is passing through the town of Siswang. All the names of the towns here are very much more aligned with Flemish-speaking Belgium than northern France. The buildings look a little bit more like Belgium as well. And certainly the terrific enthusiasts here. Oh, talking to Steve Bauer. This is Steve Bauer. This is Steve Bauer who's trying to go clear. Well, Bauer is also realizing that if you don't do the work yourself, you don't get into the frame in Paris Bay this year. He's crossing the gap, and again, he's managed to slip the attentions of the chase group. And Laurent Fignon has been doing all of the work and none of the catching. Well, this is the lead group again. We've got five riders up here at the moment. We have covered 237 kilometers and we're heading off now into sector five. That's five sectors of Pave still to go. 26 kilometers from the finish. And these riders are dangling off the front of the bunch and it seems that only those willing can catch up. And you see what I mean about the dust storm now? It's so flat the countryside here. You can see, see this dust storm all the way to Roubaix. Well, Bauer, who came into professional cycling with a big bang in 1984, he finished in the silver medal position in the Los Angeles Olympic Games in Mission Viejo in terrific hot conditions, beaten by Alexei Greywall, the American, when Alexei seemed dead on the wheels and he still pulled off a terrific sprint and Bauer could not believe he'd lost the gold medal that time. He turned professional immediately, went across to Spain and then all of a sudden the professionals had heard of Stephen Bauer because he took the bronze medal in the World Championship just a few weeks later. Tremendous start in his pro career and he's never looked back but he's still hoping to land the really big win and this could be it because look at this now, he's on, on sector five of the Paris-Roubaix. Steve Bauer has joined the leaders. We now have six men out in front and still Laurent Fignon is trapped in the bunch. Duclos Lazal is setting the pace. Solon Lilholt in second place has come up into the frame now. On the far side is Ballerini of Italy. Tarlan messing things about still in fifth place. Johan Museo on the inside with that headband on. There's some super names still in this group. Well, Bauer is on, but the legs are clearly aching. He's having to hang on for a minute. Last year, he finally won one of the world's classic races, the Grand Prix of Zurich, the championship of Zurich. He's not uh, in the top frame of classics like Paris Bay is, but nonetheless, it was a great classic win for Steve, and that followed on from a third place in the Amstel Gold Race last year as well. Finished fourth in the Tour de France in 1988, but he still remembers the man who almost wins. Hasn't quite got that big, big win onto his record book yet. But he's a very attractive rider indeed, and they say he signed this year for 7-11. Uh, enticed away from the Helvetia La Suisse team, 
and they say he's being paid a million dollars. And he's riding like a billion dollars today. He's read that absolutely right and he's left the Panasonics to block behind and now he's taking advantage of their teamwork. And that this chasing group as we watch it is going so quickly over the cobbles. Duclos Lazal enjoying himself again. Soren Lilholt, former junior world champion. And that's the end of Sector 5. And there's the face of Steve Bauer, looking a little bit more relaxed now. He's recovered from that hard chase. But you can see how close that chase group is, because Van der Nacker and Bauer came across it so quickly. And Bauer knows exactly where they are. He also knows which ones in that group are still strong. You will not want to see riders of the quality of Fignon or Duclos Lazal coming up to this group because they could mean big trouble. Well, looking down there, the long thin line. Duclos Lazal wants a little bit more assistance from somebody else here. Still no fluidity in the chase. Just one rider sprints, then sits up, nobody follows through, there's no constant speed. And while this keeps up, of course, this group here is going to move further and further away. Very shortly, they're going to have to start thinking about how to get rid of each other. Now let's have a look down, we might get a true distance there. And you probably saw one rider coming through. And I think it was Rolf Yerman there slip through. Oh no, we're back with the leaders. So that was Van Kiersburg there. Uh, who's gone through. And Van Hooydonk. Big gap still forming in this chase group as well. There's something resembling a little bit of panic here now because the riders who've come up know how just how close that chase group is. They're anxious to keep the pace up, but they don't of course want to sell out all of their energy. They still have a few nasty sections of Parve to come. And uh, this year, as with last year, we've returned now to the velodrome at Roubaix for the big finish. And the $25,000 first prize. And I must say that uh, you have to have a lot of knowledge of track riding too, because you complete one and a half laps of the steeply banked velodrome at Roubaix. Duclos Lazal knows all about that. He's twice finished second on the velodrome. Wearing glasses today, not so much to keep the sun out of his eyes as to keep the dust and dirt out of his eyes. There's Urs Frohler from the Panasonics, slowing everything down. There he is, the big man in red down there. Who's dominated the points championship on the track until this year, or last season rather, when he lost the title to another Swiss rider. He'll be back in Japan this year, no doubt, hunting for the return of the World's Points Championship to his camp. But he packs, we used to always call Urs Frohler the mercenary, because he signs on for teams and guarantees them wins in stage races. He's not a long-distance overall winner of the quality of men like Greg LeMond or Bernardi, no. But he certainly pops up with victories. He always lives up to his name as a mercenary. He snatches the stages whenever he can. Sixteen at the back, Joss van der Nacker. This will be the best ride of his life if he can pull this one off. He rides on the PDM team. I was with the PDM team in January this year in Zellamsee in Austria at their training camp. And believe me, they went through a rigorous training program. They started off at nine o'clock every morning with a run right up a ski slope to the very top. And Gerhard Zdrobelek, one of their team, used to do the best time. He got up there inside the hour. The people in the village of El Amze did not believe that anybody was running up the snow-clad mountains. And then the skis were taken to the top and they came down by ski. Then they went out on the mountain bikes across the frozen lake. And then they managed the odd ride on the road as well. Good atmosphere, but what a vigorous way to get fit. They were out there for over a week, enjoyed every minute of it. And it seems to have done 
Joss van der Nacker, the world of good. How sad it is though that Sean Kelly is not here, twice winner of Paris-Roubaix, coming to good form. And a rather silly fall last week in the Tour of Flanders. It was all in slow motion, uh, at the entrance to a small stretch of cobbles on a tight bend, the bunch virtually came to a standstill. Kelly toppled to the ground and fell awkwardly on his shoulder. Section number four of the pavé. 21 and a half kilometers left to race. This has got to be seen now as the likely winning move. The riders have dangled behind. They've allowed three riders to cross the gap and the others don't seem capable. Duclo Lazal must be getting very twitchy. He's out on the front of the bunch again. There's Furler on the near side of the camera, Son Lilholt on the far side. And Nico Verhoeven moving out too. Well, he'll be, of course, his role is now completely reversed. He's a blocking man now because he's got his teammate up in the breakaway. Gilbert Duclos is out. Everybody enjoyed a little laugh with Gilbert when he was leading in the King of the Mountains once in the Tour de France because everybody thought he couldn't climb, but he earned enough points in the small hills to wear the famous polka dot jersey. And then he had the final laugh when he finished second at Luzardi Den, which was a terrific ride a couple of years ago. And on to what will be sector number two. In fact, I think that was the exit of sector number three. So we've still got a couple of sectors of pavé to come before the finish. The annoying thing to the riders about Paris-Roubaix is towards the finish, they go literally zigzagging around the countryside. You never actually see Roubaix on the horizon. And that must be rather frustrating, I would have thought. And still we have Kurt von Kiersburg, the newcomer who's now living amongst the stars of Paris-Roubaix. He's number 209. This is John van den Acker. Slight echelon forming, indicating that for the moment at least the wind is coming from those the left of the riders, the right of our screen as we watch this chase group now. Again, Duclos is out. You may have noticed that the absence of Laurent Fignon here, well, we haven't seen him stop, but I believe he has in fact had a puncture. And he's not in, I don't think he's in this group. Now that is extremely sad, because Fignon certainly worked hard. No, he's still there. He's still there. He's tucked in nicely in the centre. So if he has punctured, he's come back. Riding with a bit more more common sense I would suggest now he's, he's worked very hard either that or he actually is very tired and he may have uh, done too much it's such a different classic isn't it from the normal run of the mills classics where you have the breakaway and the chase bunch here you have six riders almost riding individually they've hung on over the over the cobblestones and had to work their way up into this group because remember, first of all, it was Plankert, then there was the Frenchman, Marshal Gaillon, and Van Cleer, Kiersburg, who came up, and then the other three came up individually as well. But everybody here is here on merit. There's no snip about this. Rudy Darn is slowing things down at the back of the group there, because he has his teammate up front now. And same with Frehler. Soren Lilholt. Far side is further there. I saw Soren Lilholt ride a very good Tour of Holland a couple of years ago. He won a stage. Ballerini. See how close they are together now. Nobody willing to take up the chase. They really could do with somebody now to make the decision to go because as the race comes closer towards the finish, these riders are going to feel that it is theirs. John van der Nacker 
might be the first rider in this breakaway becoming a little bit suspect. I haven't seen him up near the front for quite a few kilometres. He's crashing over the cobblestones here. Well, these will be section three, so I will make it about 18 kilometres from the finish. Just listen to the sound as the, our motorbike camera, and they do a marvellous job. It is such a dangerous job living with the riders in these conditions. A difficult job for the camera too, because they have to keep out of the way of the riders. Nobody wants to prevent uh, these riders from giving their all because of a tactical mistake by a car or a camera. Uh, so can easily happen. There's Van der Nacker. He looks in trouble now. The gap is beginning to open. This is Van Hooyerdonk. He also is allowing a little bit of a gap to Marshal Gaillon. Three riders hanging on grimly there at the front. Eddie Plankert, Steve Bauer. You can almost hear Plankert's bones rattling. And look at this, it's Van Kiers, Kiersbulk again who is doing the work. He's driving along here. Well, hats off to him too. And Plankert might be revising any opinion he had earlier of him as an easy kill. So too Bauer. Van der Nacker is the man not enjoying the cobbles as much as anybody else. One or two of the riders who wear contact lenses as normal uh, find riding at Paris Bay a most difficult proposition because of the grit that gets up there behind the contact lens. And John van der Acker is in trouble. He's tailed off the back here. And van Hooyerdonk doesn't look too clever either. He's ridden Paris Bay throughout his professional career, a fifth, a 20th, and a third. And he's in the winning break here. I think it's the winning break, the way they're riding, because there's nobody seems to be able to get up to that group at all. But they're off the cobbles, and that may have just come at the right time. Bauer's one of the riders trying to get up there. But that group is coming back together again, and it looks as though John van der Acker will get across as well. So they're all back together. Thomas Wegmuller on the left of our picture. Duclo Lazal, who has always been so near yet so far. He was fourth last year in this race, just 59 seconds behind the winner. He's had two second places, and he's had a sixth as well. Surely one day is terminal. They're so close to this breakaway and they can't get across. So it's still this very plucky little Belgian, Kurt van Kiersbulk, who's setting the pace. Bauer's willing to help him out too. And this is the stretch of road where I remember Jonathan Bowyer just about now from the United States with a rather sensational crash into the ditch on our left. Unhurt, but it certainly looked good on television. But no such bad luck for this ride, these riders in this breakaway, and Touchwood, of course, none of them have uh, toyed with hell yet. They haven't punctured or crashed. The same can't be said for one or two of the other stars. And certainly, Dirk de Mol, the winner two years ago, is out. Maurizio Fondriest, who is a real favourite, he's gone as well. Speed of Bauer here now as he pounds that heavy gear over the cobbles. Very relaxed position for Eddie Planker too. Just sits there nicely on the top of the handlebars. Almost looks like he's on a Sunday run. Far more urgency in Steve Bauer on the far side. Well, I wonder what Eddie Plankett is thinking now. He knows that if this was a normal race, he has the sprint to win. But after he's been in the lead for so long, he can't possibly know that anymore. Van Hooydonk, who appeared to be in trouble, is now looking likely to become one of the survivors here, because these two are going clear of the rest of the race. I didn't see Guy on at all then. Bauer is first around the corner, followed by Plankert. Van Hooydonk is just behind them. And I think this break of six is split up once more. 
This is a nasty little stretch of cobbles, this one. It has a slight incline on it as well. And as soon as they get off the cobbles, there's a slight rise. You can just possibly see the incline here. Just makes the legs hurt that little bit more. Van Hooydonk has read that this split, this race is splitting. He's coming across very quickly indeed. It's all under the impetus, really, of Steve Bauer. Plankard has measured his effort alongside him. Bauer has crossed this gap and there's no intention of any, anybody getting up to him now. Little indication of our speed, about 42 kilometers an hour. That looked like the rather grimy face of Adrie van der Poel. Johnny Tarlin, still playing the faithful policeman. He tries to sit on the rider who has attacked away from the front of the group there. Well, Tarlin's had a great ride today, backing up his third place in the Tour de Flanders last week, showing he has terrific form. He should score well in the World Cup today. 25 points for the winner in the World Cup competition, down to the 20th man home who gets a single point. This is Van Hooyerdonk who's got on. So, good smooth roads, he's crossed the gap. 15 kilometers to go, I think that's it, to the finishing line. And three riders are now out in front. And what reputations they have. Every one of them a winner, and every one would go down in the history of Paris-Roubaix as a true winner of this event. The lineup against some of the great names in the world like Bernardino, Roger de Vlaming, Francesco Moser, Jan Raas, of course, who manages now, Edric van Hooyerdonk, who's sitting back in the following car. He won this race in 1982 when it was five kilometers longer, 270 kilometers then. And I'm sure he would like to be the manager of the winner today. Never loses any of its magic, Perry The crowds again turning out in the thousands as they dot themselves all the way around the course. Many of them watching the race on at least four different occasions because it is possible with a good map. And I know a lot of people do this. They see the riders by, they know all of the, the shortcuts and there's very often a car rally taking place around this, the back streets of northern France as they try to catch up with the race in another direction. Well, this is Nico Verhoeven here. So this is the chase group, and this is Laurent Fignon, who's still very much in the thick of things, and this uh, chase group looks to me to be disintegrated somewhat, and it's still Fignon who is trying to get something out of this Paris Bay. He's got so much strength today, if only he could get into that group of six, I think he'd cause absolute chaos. But he cannot get up there at all. He's allowed riders to go across and it's easily done. You make the effort and all of a sudden somebody spins past you, you're taking your second wind and you can't get the wheel. Before you know it, you're still where you always were and the man that's past you has gone up to the leaders. And that's exactly how Steve Bauer did it and Edwig van Hooyerdonk. Verhoeven in a spot of trouble, he's dropping off this little group. This is a chase group here that's developing. Duclo Lazal just in front, and ahead of him, John Tarlin. Tarlin seems now to have been given his head to try and get across. Entrance to Parve, or the exit from Parve, section number two. Just one more section of cobblestones to come. The adrenaline will be surging to Duclo Lazal. He's going to be saying to himself, surely I can't be this close to the, to the wind yet again and can't have it. He's willing to work for it too. He's straight through on Tarlin. Tarlin gets his wheel nicely. Seconds in it, they're only seconds behind the group ahead, and they're closing all of the time. Sixth, fourth, twice second. Duclos Lazal must be asking himself the question, will it be today for me? One of the gendarmes choosing his right line to go through, as the riders always have the right of way, but the, the Gendarmerie Nationale, who marshal these races, do it so splendidly. Back to the leaders now. Eddie Plankard out in front for the best part of 80 kilometers. Van Hooyerdonk who came up late, so too Steve Bauer. They're now fleeing for their lives because the race is closing in. And Bauer took a good look then at the face of Plankard. Sometimes they give an answer, is he tired or isn't he? But Bauer's taken one look and he's testing him now. He's out of the saddle. 
This is a slight rise, this. Again, we've zigzagged across the auto route. You can see it to our right between Brussels and France, Belgium and France, rather, Paris and Brussels. But Planckert has hung on to the wheel of Van Hooydonk. These are the three leaders now. The other two are dropping back to the mercy of the chase. The other three, rather. And sad to say, too, Kurt van Kiersbulk has gone backwards. We're left now with the talent of world cycling. And between them, I wouldn't like to... Well, I can tell you, in fact, uh, let me see now, seven, ten... They've ridden about 12 Paris-Roubaix between them, these three riders. And six or so, seven of those has been ridden by... Well, this will be his eighth, won't it? By Parry, by Eddie Plankett down there. And he hasn't won it yet, but he finished 13th in 1981. It's worth telling you the results of Eddie Plankett. He's been so consistent. 13th in 1981. As we watch the chase here, again, Tarlan is working. A little select group. Rudy Dahn is in this group now. Duke Lola's out to the right, and Adri van der Poel heading through the spearhead of this chase. Just to come back to Eddie Plankett, though. 13th in 81, 5th in 1982, 6th in 1985. 28th in 1986, 16th in 87, 15th in 88, and 5th last year. Quite clearly likes the trip through hell. Duke Lola's Al the workhorse. Fignon noticeably missing from this chase group. Fignon largely responsible alone for keeping this breakaway in reach of anybody that can find the strength to get across. Gilbert Duclo Lazal setting up the pace. He's getting on a bit now. He'll be 36 years of age in August of this year. Turned professional back in 1977. 14th professional season. He's still looking for his win in this classic race. He's never actually enjoyed a classic victory. Although he's won Bordeaux Paris, which, although it's not being held this year, was certainly one of the world's greatest classic races in his day, and the longest at that. Paced behind small motorbikes, and uh, that is how this race started out too, back in 1896 for the early years. The riders being paced by bicycles at first, then motor cars and motorcycles, before they were finally abolished in 1910, and since then it's been a race of truth, the riders riding the complete distance themselves. The record for the distance, Peter Post, the manager of the Panasonic team, let me tell you, and it's his team who have done so well so far in the race today. He's in a car behind, along with Walter Plankert. 45 kilometres an hour, Peter Post did back in 1964. That was a tremendous performance. Uh, well, it still stands, so I think that emphasises it. Went over a level crossing there, you may have just caught a glimpse of it. I've been on Paris du Bays when that gate has been down and a lot of riders have cooled the heels with great frustration. Uh, frustration, but not today. They're through the three leaders. This is the chase group, and they're still out on their own. Look, they're still clear of that uh, main chase being led by Duclos Lazal. Let's go back up to the front runners now. The riders who have ridden this course so many times, like Plankert and Edward Van Hooydonk, know that they're coming down towards the end of Paris-Roubaix now. They've laid down the cards, they're totally committed, and they're 10 kilometers from the finish. They've called back in, you may have caught a glimpse then of the neutral service vehicle, he's been called back from ahead of the race. A good indication that they now have 30 seconds over the chase, and the chase will be those three other riders, so it could even be further back to the Duclos Lazal group. They're working so well together now, these three riders. What they call bit and bit, through and off. Just enough to keep the pace going and then immediately across to the right, ease upon the pedals, let the other rider push the pace, go behind him, draft for a few seconds and then go three. Because they reckon that you save around 30% of your energy when you're riding directly in the side stream of the rider in front of you. Hard to tell from these faces, isn't it? It's just what they're thinking and which one is the strongest. And they're not going to give anything away. great art of psychology in cycling because at this stage of the race they're all tired including this young man here had a great day out hasn't he Kurt van Kiersbulk still trying to hang on in there 
So here too is John van der Nacker, but the word will have gone back that van der Nacker has been dropped by the league group, so it's quite likely now that Rudy Darnans and Nico Verhoeven will be told to ride because it's no good racing in a professional's world for second or third place. All the top pro teams want the win. And as expected, there's Darnans driving at the front of this chase group in the white helmet. 71, Adri van der Poel. 31 is Duclos Lazal. The ones, by the way, usually given to the riders who are leaders of their team. And Duclos Lazal is leader of the Z team today in the absence of world champion and Tour de France winner Greg Lamont, who is not enjoying the best of starts to his season. He's a long way to go to find the form if he's uh, really intending to win this summer's Tour de France. And in fact, messages are reaching us from the cars out on the course that Lolland Fignon has been dropped by this team. And they're saying that he has been in some sort of a collision with photographers as well, but he's riding. But he's certainly out of the hunt. So Fignon is out of the hunt for the finish at Paris Bay. That's a great shame because he really did contribute to this race today. So hopes for France now, resting with Duclos Lazalle and Marshal Gaillon. The Wyman boys, Thomas Wegmuller taking the pace through off his teammate Adri van der Poel. Terrific tempo now from Edwig van Hooydonk. Bauer handling it in his stride. Van Hooydonk must feel a little bit inferior to these two riders. They can both pack a good sprint, but if it was to be a normal sprint finish, then one would normally make Plankett now the odds-on favourite. He has a terrific finish. He's won many races because of it over the year. He had 18 victories in 1986. That's his biggest season so far since he turned pro in 87, when he didn't win a single race, by the way. In 1980, well, not 87, 1980. But since then, he's won stages in the Tour of Spain. And, of course, his biggest victory, I think, which he might uh, agree with me here, would be the Tour of Flanders back in 1988. He also ran out the holder of the green jersey in the Tour de France in that same year. Emulated his brother, Walter Plankert, who is now back in the cars as his manager. But it just shows you, doesn't it, that all of the expert opinion was when they saw Plankard attack with so far to go that the man is crazy, he's always been crazy, and what on earth is he doing in a wind like this on a cold day? He hasn't got any chance of survival, when if he stayed in the group he could win in the sprint. Well now look at it, they're hanging on in there, they're inside eight kilometres to go, and Eddie Plankard on the left of our picture is still here. And Steve Bauer has come up with a, a personally a terrific performance. And Ed, so too, Edwig van Hooydonk. The spectators try desperately just to reach out to their rivals, and if they're not careful, they'll get wiped out by the following cars. Well, a little bit of tarmac on the inside, and all the riders finding it. Duclos has gone to the back of the group behind Darnans, Johan Museu, Ersfreda. That elite group, all that is left, because apparently there are fewer than 50 riders still on the course. And Laurent Fignon, by the way, has retired. Fignon has gone. The landscape never changes. Flat. Many people say you need a hill in every bicycle race to bring out the best. Well, if you put a few cobblestones, I think uh, you bring out something even more special in a bike rider. They're so tenacious. These riders, by the way, join the week in their team formation. Most of them, who have visions of victory, have been out training over the course as well. They usually take the car out as far as Troisville, which is the famous starting town of the sections of cobblestones. It comes in at around the 100 kilometer point and they usually ride from Troisville over the complete route to the finish in Roubaix just to see what it's like and where possible memorize the bad corners and the biggest holes. 
The race these days starting from Compiègne, about 80 kilometers to the north of Paris. It no longer starts in the city. Very few races, in fact, do these days. Even Paris-Nice only starts in the center of Paris with a time trial. Then normally everybody drives away from the city by car for the first stage the following day. Still there are riders in this group wanting to chase and in the case of Johnny Tarlin who's going through now you can see he's visibly slowing the pace down here. No interest at all. He's got this pace just as he wants it. Everybody's under control and they're all riding into the pocket of the Panasonic team. In this picture you can almost feel as though you're on the bike there with Edwin van Hooydonk. You can feel a little pain in those legs too. Those muscles are aching now. He tries to keep the rhythm going. And they've been pedaling these very heavy gears for six and three quarter hours. A word in the ear of Plankett because this looks like the Panasonic car. Whatever well, it is, Plankett's uh, ear being spoken to. It's being done so by brother Walter. Walter and Willie, the other two famous members of the Plankett family who won many of the world's major races and their father won as well. And they tell me that one of uh, Eddie's nephews is turning out to be a star in the junior ranks, so it's not over yet. Well, Plankett will have been told exactly what is going on. Van Hooydonk being a Belgian will have understood every word of it, of course, in Flemish. I'm not too sure whether Steve Bauer will, but I would suggest he would, because he lives not too far away from the French borders in Belgium, in Courtrijk. There's a little bit of the impetus gone here. I think Van Hooydonk is sensing it. He's going to start stretching them a little bit. This isn't an attack, just a test, I would say. <laughs> just like a plank at there, straight onto his wheel. Almost touching it. Almost bumping on his back wheel there. And there's our cameraman down there in the thick of the action too. We should see that shot any minute. Oh, there it is. The best seat in the house. And here again is Walter Plankett. He was there so long that he must have given a complete rundown of what is happening behind, who he's chasing, where they are. We haven't been back for a while. Oh, look at this. Bowers having a go, and a good go, too. Digging very deep into the reserve to see just what's left in the legs of the other two. He's caught Van Hooydonk. Van Hooydonk, nowhere like the 0 to 10 second man there. And in fact, we've just gone through the five kilometer marker on the lamppost. And Van Hooydonk has come back on, but you could see the acceleration of Plankett. That's why he's a pure sprinter. He can accelerate so quickly, but Van Hooydonk was a lot slower off the mark. And it looks as though Steve Bauer has decided that Plankett is perhaps a little bit more fresh than he thought. That'll cause Bauer to rethink the game, and he won't want to stay in the front too long either because uh, the more work he does at the front, the less chance he's going to have of finishing him off in the sprint of Paris-Roubaix uh, in the velodrome. Well, over the years, this race has become one of the biggest races, single-day races for prize money as well. And back in 1982, I think it was, the first prize was around 8,000 French francs. If you're English like I am, that's about £800, and uh, if you're talking dollars, of course, it's about $1,200, $1,300. But nowadays, the first prize has absolutely accelerated almost out of sight. It's now 130,000 French francs for the winner. The inseparables, but there's still a lot of concerns. So I would suggest that Walter Plankett has actually told Eddie that the group behind is by no means giving up and they are coming back. It could be that our cameras have not been allowed into the gap now because it is close and that is the reason we're not seeing too much. Let's have a look down from the helicopter. This is still the lead group. 
flying right above the riders who have been out in front for so long in this Paris-Roubaix. And Bauer is doing most of the work now. We're now in the outskirts of Roubaix. It's not a very pretty approach. We go around what appears to be almost warehousing before we finally run into the velodrome down a dual carriageway. And it certainly isn't too far, is it? Because somebody's gone through there and they are very, very close indeed. I think that was Marshal Gaillon, in fact. And I can't, he must have got away again from the group that picked him up because that looked to me like Gaillon chasing through the streets and he can't be very far behind because they are 10 seconds maybe. And Plankett is doing nothing now. Plankett is gambling here, gambling that nobody picks him up. He sits at the back, Van Hooydonk in the middle. The two Belgian riders are now thinking they'll let the Canadian do all of the work and take care of him in the velodrome. Steve Bauer is a bit more intelligent than to allow this to happen, I would suggest. But he might feel that if he doesn't keep this pace going, there'll be nothing for anybody. And let's have a look, it is Marshall Gaon. I don't know where Marshall Gaon has found the strength to get off the front of that breakaway yet again because he was with the three leaders. He was dropped on the par there. He's now trying to get back up with them. A tremendous ride by this man who does feel he rides well in Paris-Roubaix. He finished 10th in 1987. That's his best finish to date. Winner of Paris Camembert, another French classic, but uh, nothing of the makings of Paris Roubaix. Van Hooydonk in a little bit of trouble over the cobblestone. Put him on cobbles, he goes backwards now. The two fast finishers are going away. Van Hooydonk is at the limit of his speed. And still Plankard doesn't want to go through, and I think Bauer actually had a word with him there. And look at this chase by Gaillon. He is about six seconds behind those three and they are back together. He can see them all of the time and he's coming up quickly. And from what I can understand, Jean-Marie Wampers is also chasing alone. And this is all happening in the last couple of kilometers. We should see the kite very shortly. That'll be the red triangle that flies with one kilometer to go. When we see it, it'll be a kilometer from the stadium. Steve Bauer has been committed to the front of this group and it seems that, now there's the kite, that was the kite hanging off the banner, one kilometre to go to the stadium, one and a half laps to the stadium to come, three riders in contention, these three riders, the same three riders who have been in the front now for the best part of 60 kilometres, well 85 kilometres in the case of Plankett and uh, considerably less for the other two because they came across, about 40 kilometres for Bauer and Van Hooydonk. Well, Gaillon is still living a hope. He can snatch this right on the line and all of France's as well because they've only had two wins since 1956. Louis and Bobé won in 56. He was there to see Bernard Eno win in 1981 and soon after that, sadly, Louis and Bobé passed away. And now, Gaillon can just latch on. He might produce the result. That's how he won the silver medal in the World Championships back in 1988. One of those men involved then is involved now, Steve Bauer. This is the approach to the stadium. We'll turn right shortly into the velodrome. And here we go. Plankett is the first in. The, no, I beg your pardon. Plankett the second in. Bauer is first in. The brakes are going on. It looks as though they want Plankett in the front. They're slowing right down and this is going to let Gaon on because I believe Gaon has been joined by Wampers out of sight of our camera. So we've got two riders in a couple of seconds, that's all, a couple of seconds off our camera. And they're coming on very, very quickly indeed. Into the stadium, Steve Bauer brings Eddie Plankett and a big cheer goes up too, just behind Eddie Plankett. Edwig van Hooydonk again, no Frenchman present at the moment. As they come onto the track now, but already in the stadium, just behind them we have Vampers and there they are, there they are, right down on the inside, they're going to go straight through, this will be a stunning blow to Eddie Plankett, he didn't expect to see anybody, now he's seeing his teammate and the winner a year ago, Jean-Marie Vampers leading immediately, Plankett takes his wheel, so Vampers is looking to lead out, Plankett for the sprint, the bell and one lap to go, five riders fighting out now, the finish of Paris-Roubaix. 
Bombers looks content, even as last year's winner here, to help Eddie Blanca take the sprint. Bauer is in the back of the group, but Van Hoyerdon goes for a long one. He's the least likely to win the sprint. Bauer gets his wheel, a good piece of riding by Steve Bauer. Planka tries to come on him too. But look at this ride now by Van Hoydon, goes high, opens the door to Steve Bauer. Bauer comes on the inside, and it looks as though Steve Bauer is going to get that first classic victory on the line. They are almost together, and you know Eddie Planka was right on him on the line. We'll have to look at that again, but there was nothing in it at all. Absolutely nothing in it. Here's the group sprint coming in. And Gilbert Duclos Lazal, Thomas Wegmuller, Adri van der Poel were heading home that sprint. But look at this crowd. There's nobody here knows who has won Paris Roubaix. Because right on the line, which is where we are commentating from, it is not apparent at all. Well, we'll have a chance to see that again in slow motion. But uh, I can see Walter Plankert down in the centre of the track, and he's congratulating Eddie Plankert. Now let's look at this, from our high camera. Well, that should be Plankett on the left, and on the right is Bauer. And you know, I don't know. That will go to a decision. I know what my decision would be, a dead heat. And I think it would be the fairest result, but I'm sure they'll come up with the answer. Let's have one more look at it from this direction. Steve Bauer on the right at this stage was in the clear lead. I don't know where Eddie Plankett found it from. I bet his eyes were shut though, as he just lunged his bike at the line. Watch the white line. Oh, it's possible that Plankett has shaded it. And in fact, they are saying that the victory has indeed gone to Eddie Plankett. The scrummage is on here as the cameramen seek out the Belgian. He has finally won. Paris Roubaix in the eighth time, and there he is, Eddie Plankett, the winner of Paris Roubaix in the closest finish in the history of cycling. The official verdict is one millimeter. And while we watch Eddie Plankett here, let me give you the complete result a win for Eddie Plankett of Belgium for Panasonic. His time, seven hours, 37 minutes, and two seconds, beating Steve Bauer of Canada by a millimeter and everybody's heart must go out to Steve Bauer from the 7-Eleven team. Edwig van Hoyerdonk from the Buckler team is in third place. Marshall Gaon, who was with that group and finally nearly caught him up again. He was placed fourth at three seconds back and Jean-Marie Wampers, the winner a year ago, was fifth in the same time as Gaon. Gilbert Duclos Lazal, will he ever win? Just watch this finish while I continue with the result. Duclos Lazal finished sixth, Thomas Wegmuller was seventh, Adrie Van der Poel was eighth, and Rudy Darmans was ninth, John Tarlin finished tenth. So, as we watch the closest finish in the history of the sport, without the referees declaring a dead heat between Steve Bauer of Canada and Eddie Plankett of Belgium, the Paris Roubaix, the queen of the classics, has once again truly lived up to its name. From the Roubaix Velodrome in France, with two riders looking to have won the race, it's goodbye.